the second part of the oldest doctrine. Among Fenda's people, there are false teachers who by their over inventiveness have become so wicked that they make themselves and their adherents believe that they are the best part of Heralda, that their spirit is the best part of Heralda's spirit, and that Heralda can only think by the help of their brains that every creature is a part of Geralda's eternal being and that they have stolen from us but their false reasoning and ungovernable pride have brought them on the road to ruin. Their spirit was Geralda's spirit. And then Geralda would be very stupid instead of being sensible and wise for their spirit labors to create beautiful statues which they afterwards worship. Fenda's people are so wicked for although they presumptuously pretend among themselves that they are gods, they proclaim the unconsecrated false gods and declare everywhere that these idols created the world and all that there is in. Greedy idols full of envy and anger who desire to be served and honored by the people and who exact bloody sacrifices and rich offerings. But these presumptuous and false men who call themselves God's servants and priests receive and collect everything in the name of the idols that have no real existence for their own benefit. <clears throat> they do all this with an easy conscience as they think themselves gods and not answerable to anyone. If there are some who discover their tricks and expose them, they hand them over to the executioners to be burnt for the calumnies with solemn ceremonies in honor of the false gods, but really in order to save themselves, in order that our children may be protected against their idolatrous doctrine, the duty of the maidens is to make them learn by heart the following. Geralda existed before all things and will endure after all things. Geralda is also internal and everlasting. Therefore, nothing exists without him. From Geralda's life sprang time and all living things, and his life takes away time and every other thing. These things must be made clear and manifest in every way, so that they can be made clear and comprehensible to all. When we have learned thus much, then we say further, in what regards our existence? We are part of Geralda's everlasting being, like the existence of all created beings. But as regards our form, our qualities, our spirit, and all our thoughts, these do not belong to the being. All these are passing things which appear through Geralda's life and which appear through his wisdom and not otherwise. But whereas his life is continually progressing, nothing can remain stationary. Therefore, all created things change their locality, their form, and their thoughts. So either the earth, so neither the earth nor other created object can say, I am, but rather I was. So no man can say, I think, but rather I thought. The boy is greater and different from the child. He has different desires, inclinations, and thoughts. The man and father feels and thinks differently from the boy, and the old man just the same. Everybody knows that. Besides, everybody knows and must acknowledge that he is now changing, that he changes every minute even while he says, I am, and that his thoughts change even while he says, I think. Instead then of imitating Fenda's wicked people and saying, I am the best part of Ralda, and through us alone he can think, we proclaim everywhere where it is necessary, we, Freya's children, exist through Ralda's life. In the beginning, mean and base, but always advancing towards perfection without ever attaining the excellence of Ralda himself. Our spirit is not Geralda's spirit. It is merely a shadow of it. When Geralda created us, he lent us his wisdom, brains, organs, memory, and many other good qualities. 
And by this means we are able to contemplate his creatures and his laws. By this means we can learn and can speak of them always and only for our own benefit. If Geralda had given us no organs, we should have known nothing and been more irrational than a piece of seaweed driven up and down by the ebb of and flood. This is written on parchment, scrivelt, speech, and answer to the other maidens as an example. An unsociable, avaricious man came to complain to Troost, who was the maid of Stavia. He said a thunderstorm had destroyed his house. He had prayed to Geralda, but Geralda had given him no help. Are you a true Frisian? Troost asked. From father and forefathers, replied the man. Then she said, I will sow something in your conscience, in confidence that it will take root, grow, and bear fruit. She continued, When Freya was born, our mother stood naked and bare, unprotected from the rays of the sun. She could ask no one, and there was no one who could give her any help. Then Geralda wrought in her conscience inclination and love, anxiety and fright. She looked round her, and her inclination chose the best. She sought a hiding place under the shelter, sheltering lime trees. But the rain came, and the difficulty was that she got wet. She had seen how the water ran down the pendant leaves, so she made a roof of leaves fastened with a stick. But the wind blew, the rain under it. She observed that the stem would afford protection. She then built a wall of sods, first on one side, and then all around. The wind grew stronger and blew away the roof, but she made no complaint of Geralda. She made a roof of rushes and put stones upon it. Having found how hard it is to toil alone, she showed her children how and why she had done it. They acted and thought as she did. This is the way in which we became possessed of houses and porches, a street and lime trees to protect us from the rays of the sun. At last we have built a citadel and all the rest. If your house is not strong enough, then you must try and make another. My house was strong enough, he said, but the flood and wind destroyed it. Where did your house stand? Troost asked. On the bank of the Rhine, he answered. Did it not stand on a knoll? Troost asked. No, said the man. My house stood alone on the bank. I built it alone, but I could not make a hillhock. I knew it, Troost answered. The maidens told me. All your life you have avoided your neighbors, fearing that you might have to give or do something for them. But one cannot get on in the world in that way, for Geralda, who is kind, turns away from the niggardly. Fasta has advised us, and it is engraved in stone over all our doors. If you are selfish, distrustful towards your neighbors, teach your neighbors, help your neighbors, and they will return the same to you. If this advice is not good enough for you, I can give you no better. The man blushed for shame and slunk away. Now I will write myself first about my citadel and then about what I have been able to see. The city lies near the north end of Liugart. The tower has six sides and is 90 feet high, flat roofed with a small house upon it out of which they look to at the stars. On either side of the tower is a house 300 feet long and 21 feet broad and 21 feet high besides the roof, which is round. All this is built of hard baked bricks and outside there's nothing else. The citadel is surrounded by a dike with a moat 36 feet broad and 21 feet deep. If one looks down from the tower, he sees the form of the jewel. In the ground among the houses on the south side, all kinds of native and foreign herbs grow, of which the maidens must study the qualities. Among the houses on the north side, there are only fields, and three houses on the north are full of corn and other necessaries. The two houses on the south 
are for the maidens to live in and keep school. The most southern house is the dwelling of the Burkmogd. In the tower hangs the lamp. The walls of the tower are decorated with precious stones. On the south wall, the text is inscribed. On the right side of this are the formulae, and on the other side, the laws. The other things are found upon the three other sides. Against the dike, near the house of the Burkmog, stand the oven and the mill, worked by four oxen. Outside the citadel wall is the place where the Burkthreen <clears throat> and the soldiers live. The fortification outside is an hour long, not a seaman's hour, but an hour of the sun, of which 24 go to a day. Inside it is a plain five feet below the top. On it are 300 crossbows covered with wood and leather. Besides the houses of the inhabitants, there are along the inside of the dike 36 refuge houses for the people who live in the neighborhood. The field serves for a camp and for a meadow. On the south side of the outer fortification is the Lugard, enclosed by the great wood of lime trees. Its shape is three-cornered and with the widest part outside, so that the sun may shine in it, for there are a great number of foreign trees and flowers brought by seafarers. All the other citadels are the same shape as ours, only not so large, but the largest of all is that of Texland. The tower of the Freiburgt is so high that it sends, that it rends the sky and all the rest is in protection of the tower. In our citadel, this is the arrangement. Seven young maidens attend to the lamp. Each watch is three hours. In the rest of their time, they do housework, learn and sleep. When they have watched for seven years, they are free. Then they may go among the people to look after their morals and to give advice. When they have been three years maidens, they may sometimes accompany the older ones. The writer must teach the girls to read, to write, and to reckon. The elders, or greva, must teach them justice and duty, morals, botany, and medicine, history, traditions, and singing. Besides all that, may be necessary for them to give advice. The Bergmod must teach them how to set to work when they go among the people. Before a Bergmod can take office, she must travel through the, whole, the country a whole year. Three gray-headed Bergtherin and three old maidens must go with her. This was the way that I did. My journey was along the Rhine on this side up and on the other side down. The higher I went, the poorer the people seemed to be. Everywhere about the Rhine, the people dug holes, and the sand that was got out was poured with water over fleeces to get the gold. But the girls did not wear golden crowns of it. Formerly, they were more numerous, but since we lost Schoenland, they have gone up to the mountains where they dig ore and make iron. Above the Rhine among the mountains, I have seen Marsitan. The Marsitan are people who live on the lakes. Their houses are built upon piles for protection from wild beasts and wicked people. There are wolves, bears, and horrible lions. Then come the Swiss, the nearest to the frontiers of the distant Italians, the followers of Calta, and the savage Twiskar, all greedy for robbery and booty. The Marsitan gain their livelihood by fishing and hunting. The skins are sewn together by the women and prepared with birch bark. The small skins are as soft as a woman's skin. The Bergtmod at Freiburg, Freiburg told us that they were good, simple people. But if I had not heard her speak of them first, I would have thought that they were not Freya's people. They looked so impudent. Their wool and herbs are bought by the Rhine people and taken to foreign countries by the ship captains. Along the other side of the Rhine, it was just the same as at Lindesburgt, Linden. There was a great river or lake, and upon this lake also there were people living upon piles 
but they were not Freya's people. They were black and brown men who had been employed as rowers to bring home the men who had been making foreign voyages, and they had to stay there till the fleet went back. At last we came to Aldergerga. At the head of the south harbor lies the Waterburgt, built of stone, in which all kinds of clothes, weapons, shells, and horns are kept, which were brought by the sea people from distant lands. A quarter of an hour's distance from there is Aldergera. A great river surrounded by houses, sheds, and gardens, all richly decorated. In the river lay a great fleet ready with banners of all sorts of colors. On Freya's day the shields were hung on board likewise. Sun shone like the sun. The shields of the sea king and the admiral were bordered with gold. From the river a canal was dug going past the citadel. Farana, Verunin, with a narrow outlet to the sea. This was the egress of the fleet. The fly was the ingress. On both sides of the river were fine houses built, painted in bright colors. The gardens are all surrounded by green hedges. I saw there women wearing felt tunics as if it were riding felt, just as at Stavaren. The girls wore golden crowns on their heads and rings on their arms and ankles. To the south of Farana lies Alkmarum. Alkmarum is a lake or river in which there is an island. On this island, the black and brown people must remain, the same as Leidesbergt. The Bergtmagd of Farana told me that the Bergtherin go every day to teach them what real freedom is and how it behooves men to live in order to obtain the blessing of world of spirit. If there was anyone who was willing to listen and could comprehend, he was kept there till he was fully taught. That was done in order to instruct the distant people and to make friends everywhere. I had been before in Saxamarken at the Menagarda Furta castle, Munster, there I saw more poverty than I could discover wealth here, she answered. So whenever at the Saxamarken a young man courts a young girl, the girl asks, can you keep your house free from the banished Twisklanders? Have you ever killed any of them? How many cattle have you already caught? And how many bear and wolf skins have you brought to market? And from this it comes that the Saxons have left the cultivation of the soil to the women that not one in a hundred can read or write. From this it comes too, that no one has a motto on his shield, but only a misshapen form of some animal that he has killed. And lastly from this comes also that they are very warlike, but sometimes as stupid as the beast that they catch, and as poor as the Twisklanders, with whom they go to war. The earth and the sea were made for Freya's people. All our rivers run into the sea. The Lydas people and the Fendus people will exterminate each other, and we must people the empty countries. In movement and sailing is our prosperity. If you wish the Highlanders to share our riches and wisdom, I will give you a piece of advice. Let the girls, when they are asked to marry, before they say yes, ask their lovers. What parts of the world have you traveled in? What can you tell your children about distant lands and distant people? If they do this, then the young warriors will come to us. They will become wiser and richer, and we shall have no occasion to deal with those nasty people. The youngest of the maids who were with me came from Saxon Marken. When we came back, she asked to leave to go home. Afterwards, she became Bergdmog there. And that is the reason why, in these days, so many of our sailors are Saxons. End of Apollonia's book. Felt very thin and compressed with a smooth surface. The writings of Frethoric and Wiljo. My name is Frethoric, surnamed Oralinda, which means Overlinden. In Ludwardia, I was chosen as Aska. 
Lutwardia is a new village with the fortification of the Lutgarda, of which the name has fallen into disrepute. In my time, much has happened. I had written a good deal about it, but afterwards much more was related to me. I will write an account of both one and the other after this book to honor the good people and to the grace of the bad. In my youth, I heard complaints on all sides. The bad time was coming. The bad time did come. Freya had forsaken us. She withheld from us all her watchmaidens because monstrous, idolatrous images had been found within our landmarks. I burnt with curiosity to see those images. In our neighborhood, a little old woman tottered in and out of the houses, always calling out about bad times. I came to her, she stroked my chin. Then I became bold and asked her if she would show me the bad times and the images. She laughed good-naturedly and took me to the citadel. An old man asked me if I could read and write. No, I said. And you must first go and learn, he replied, otherwise it may not be shown to you. I went daily to the writer and learnt. Eight years afterwards, I heard that our Berkmogd had been unchaste, and that some of the Berkthreen had committed treason with the Magi, and many people took their part. Everywhere disputes arose. There were children rebelling against their parents. Good people were secretly murdered. The little old woman who had brought everything to light was found dead in a ditch. My father, who was a judge, would have avenged her. He was murdered in the night in his own house. Three years after that, the Magi was master without any resistance. The Saxman had remained religious and upright. All the good people fled to them. My mother died of it. Now I did like the others. The Maggie prided himself upon his cunning, but Ertha made him know that she would not tolerate any Maggie or idol on the holy bosom that had borne Freya. As a wild horse tosses his mane after he has thrown his rider, so Ertha shook her forests and her mountains. Rivers flowed over the land. The sea raged. Mountains spouted fire to the clouds, and what they vomited forth the clouds flung upon the earth. At the beginning of the Armanand harvest month, the earth bowed towards the north and sank down lower and lower in the Welve Mand, winter month. The low lands of Freya's land were buried under the sea. The woods in which the images were, were torn up and scattered by the wind. The following year, the frost came in Hardmond. Lomond January, and laid Freya's land concealed under a sheet of ice. The Shalomond, Sprokelmond, February. There were storms of wind from the north, driving mountains of ice and stones. When the spring tides came, the earth raised herself up, the ice melted. With the ebb, the forests, with the images, drift out to sea. In the wind, Minimond, Bloemond, May, everyone who dared went home. I came with a maiden to the citadel, Ludgard. How sad it looked there, the forest of Linda Orden were almost all gone. Where Ludgard used to be was sea, the waves swept over the fortifications. Ice had destroyed the tower. The houses lay heaped over each other. On the slope of the dike I found a stone on which the writer had inscribed his name. That was a sign to me. The same thing had happened to other citadels as to ours. In the upper lands they had been destroyed by the earth, in the lower lands by the water. Freiesburg at Texland was the only one found uninjured, but all the land to the north was sunk under the sea and has never been recovered. At the mouth of the Flymere, as we were told, 30 salt swamps were found, consisting, consisting of the forest and the ground that had been swept away. At West Flyland, there were 50. The canal which had run across the land from Aldarga was filled up with sand and destroyed. 
seafaring people and other travelers who were at home had saved themselves, their goods, and their relations upon their ships. But the black people at Leidesburg and Alcamaram had done the same. And as they went south, they saved many girls, and as no one came to claim them, they took them for their wives. The people who came back all lived within the lines of the citadel, as outside there was nothing but mud and marsh. The old houses were all smashed together. People bought cattle and sheep from the upper lands, and in the great houses were formerly the maidens, where established cloth and felt were made for a livelihood. This happened 1,800 years after the submersion of Otland. For 282 years, we had not had an Eremolder, and now, when everything seemed lost, they set about choosing one. The lot fell upon Gosa, surnamed Makonta. She was Bartmott at Freiesburg in Texland. She had a clear head and strong sense and was very good. And as her citadel was the only one that had been spared, everyone saw in that her call. Ten years after that, the seafarers came from Farana and Leidesburg. They wished to drive the black men with their wives and children out of the country. They wished to obtain the opinion of the mother upon the subject. She asked them, Can you send them all back to their country? If so, then lose no time, or they will find no relatives alive. No, they said, Gosa replied. They have eaten your bread and salt. They have placed themselves entirely under your protection. You must consult your own hearts, but I will give you one piece of advice. Keep them till you are able to send them back, but keep them outside your citadels. Watch over their morals and educate them as if they were Freya's sons. Their women are the strongest here. Their blood will disappear like smoke. Till at last, nothing but Freya's blood will remain in their descendants. So they remained here. Now I should wish that my descendants would observe in how far Gosa spoke the truth. When our country began to recover, there came troops of poor Saxon men and women to the neighbors, neighborhoods of Stavren and Aldergra to search for gold and other treasures in the swampy lands, but the sea people would not permit it. So they went and settled in the empty village of West Flyland in order to preserve their lives.